Hey there, everybody. Ian Lee here. Hope you all are well today. In this video, I'm going to be um, expanding upon this concept of seeing through the lens of Barry Harris. And what I mean by that, I did an episode um, a couple posts ago now called Paganini and Pivots, Seeing Through the Lens of Barry Harris. And the idea was that I was taking a, a Barry Harris kind of core idea, one of the things that he prescribes that we practice and work on and learn and pay attention to, and going into a classical piece of music and saying, well, look at this little chunk here. Oh, that's one of those things. This is something Barry would talk about, something we can do, something we could bend and utilize, you know? So I want to do the same thing here, but with a Stefan Grappelli line. Now, Stefan Grappelli, um, just for anybody who may not know, is was one of the forefathers of jazz violin. He was Django Reinhardt's great partner in crime for many, many years. Um, he was a brilliant, beautiful improviser. Um, really, I think, one of the best improvisers of the age in general. Uh, to me, up there with like Charlie Parker. He just He just was so fluid, so open. It was just... Uh, you could watch videos of Stefan, listen to him as a young man, go watch him as an older man. I, mean, I think he lived into his 80s or 90s and just <laughs> played beautifully the whole time. So anyways, we're going to be looking at a line that he played over It's Only a Paper Moon. Um, this is from the Django and Rome sessions, which are some of my favorite. Um, it's Django, Stefan, piano, bass, and drums. And it's just a really great combination. They're their playing is excellent. They're, they're mature as musicians. They're really fun recordings. I highly suggest checking them out. Uh, in fact, I'll link to the specific song, and if I can find the album, I'll link to that below as well. Now, um, you know, something... Uh, well, let's, let's just dive into looking at the line first. So if we look at It's Only a Paper Moon, we have, in this case, they're playing it in the key of G. Now, if we take out all the excess fat in terms of passing chords and stuff... What you get with it's only a paper moon in the first four bars is G, D7 for two bars, and then G for another bar. So you have, it is only a paper moon, say the Nova cardboard C. Okay? Now, Stefan, when he starts his solo, I think this is the second phrase or so of the solo. He does a little something over that one chord, and the five chord comes in. I believe he starts on the upbeat of that first bar. We have two bars of the five chord, and he does this wonderful thing. Oh, and forgive me, I'm, I'm not bowing today because I have like a weird shoulder and neck thing going on, so I'm trying to relax that and not put any extra stress on it. So I'll be plucking. He does this thing where I'm paraphrasing this. <clears throat> I listened to it a little bit before I did the video, but I learned this solo a couple years back, and this spot always stood out to me, which is why I'm making this video. So <clears throat> I may not be exact if you go back and figure it out for yourself but it's close so what he does is um okay so i know for a fact this part is right and that's the part i want to look at the most now what he's doing there is he's playing c e g b d and what that is is that's a four note chord that's c major seven beautiful and then he's um, going up a minor third from that B at the end to this D. So he's just going back to the root of the dominant, if you want to think of it like that. Now, how this relates to Barry Harris and why this is so cool to me and why I wanted to bring it up is Barry talks about when we have a dominant chord, one of the things he talks about is that we can, we can, or we have three important arpeggios that we can play over the dominant. We have probably, you know, the most important, and I don't know if that's even the right words, but I'll use it for now, which is the arpeggio we find off of the five of the dominant chord. In this case, we have an A minor arpeggio. So D, F sharp, A, A is the five of D. So we have, okay, and that's a wonderful thing to play there. That's in fact where we think about two, two minor seven to five seven, a minor 7 to D7 in this case, that's where that comes from, okay? Now, he also says there's an important arpeggio on the root of the chord, so D, just a D major arpeggio. And by arpeggio, Barry means, you know, a triad with the lowest note, uh, an octave 
higher on the top. So we're just playing the F sharp, A, D. We're not playing four note chords at the moment. Now, the next and last of the important arpeggios is a major arpeggio played off of the flat seven of the chords. So in this case, C is our flat seven. So C, E, G, C. Now, here's where this gets really cool in terms of what Stefan was doing. The dominant chord comes along in the progression. So we have a D7, it pops up, and then I think it starts again on the, the upbeat of that bar, just that, that the and of one. And he plays not a C major arpeggio, but he plays a C uh, major four note chord. So he plays C major seven. Now that is cool. And now here's the thing, Barry wasn't around teaching back then or anything like that. So this is just Stefan's uh, improvisational intuition. It's his ears, his uh, auditory experience directing him as he's moving through the tune, right? Because ideally as we're improvising, you're not overthinking or thinking too much or thinking at all. You're just expressing what's popping up in the moment, right? It's just all that work just whew, coming out. So and what comes out for him? It's one of the important arpeggios as a four note chord. And then what happens? He goes up a minor third to the root of that chord of D7 that he's playing over. So to me, this is so cool because it validates what Barry has been saying this whole time. Because Barry, um, you know, and someone who may know better who's watching his channel, please let me know if I'm incorrect on this, but I believe he transcribed a lot in his younger years to learn how to improvise. And over time, as he kept working and transcribing and listening and working with students and doing his own playing, he kind of came up with these codifications of like, if you want, you know, the, these are the things that we can practice to that are, that we see a lot of, that we hear a lot of. Um, and yet simultaneously, nobody sounds the same practicing in various system because this, the concepts are flexible. In this instance, for example, I'm making the concept flexible. He says important arpeggio. Well, Stefan is giving us the important four note chord, as it were. It's still the same idea. We're playing a major chord off that flat seven, but we're adding the four, the four note as with the extension. So we're making it a major seven chord, and then we go a little further with it. And to me, that's beautiful because they just end up reinforcing each other. That's what I love about it. That's what I love about this and why I wanted to share this with all of you because I think it's, the more I work with Barry's ideas and systems, the more that I actually feel more open, more free, more positive, more inspired, more creative as an improviser because the system is that flexible. It's that fluid, it's that open. And yet the concepts, the foundation of it is so solid. It's, it's hard to argue with it, I mean, really. I mean, for me it is, you know, I'm sure there's, everybody has their own take on it, but I'm sharing my own enthusiasm with this stuff. And I um, think it's cool that, I, that this connection came to be even years apart. Like I said, I think I learned this solo a couple years back or something. So, so now what do we know from that? Okay, well now I know if I wanted to practice this in all 12 keys, I could play a four note major seven chord plus a minor third above that last note. And suddenly I have um, that phrase spelled out over whatever dominant chord I'm playing. And I think that is so cool. You could even take this a step further if you wanted to. It just thought, of, thought about this. You could take the same concept, but off of the tritone. So if the tritone of D7 is A flat seven. Uh, it's flat seven would be, uh, why am I blanking? Uh, sorry. G flat or F sharp. So you could play over that D7, right? So that's, and then you can practice these things and, uh, and apply them to your solos. And it's just so cool. It, it, it's, um, these are very opening experiences. They're not closed systems, they're open systems. They're systems that allow for growth and expansion. And that's why I think they're so beautiful. So, you can run these things like that and see like just then I knew like, oh, well, what's another way you can play over a dominant chord? Well, you can play with the tritone. Oh, well, every dominant chord has three important arpeggios. Oh, well, that means that I could do this same concept, but off of the tritone. 
right? And then what happens? I play an F sharp, which is the third of D. I play a B flat, which is the flat 13. I play um, C sharp, which is the major seven. That's cool, I have no problem with that. Whatever, it's fine. And then we have F, which is the uh, flat nine. And then we have, uh, what is that? A flat, which is the flat five. So now I get a whole bunch of altered tones just swooping in over that chord if that's what I wanted to do. So anyways, I hope this was um, inspiring to y'all and, and helps you to go further into whatever practice you're doing. And, and maybe if you're into Barry's thinking or you're into Stefan, it helps you kind of clarify some things. Oh, one thing I wanted to tie off with here. I'm glad I remembered this was, here's the other reason that I love this stuff, Barry's thinking, is it simplifies all of this. I didn't have to sit there and go, oh, it's this tone, it's this tone, it's this tone. I can just go, oh, well, what's the flat seven of the tritone? Okay, play a major seven chord off that. See how much simpler that becomes like that? For me, it does. It simplifies the thinking about it. So it's no longer like, well, so here he's playing the this and the this and this, and I'm not saying we shouldn't know numbers. I'm not saying that at all. We absolutely should know numbers. These are great things to have under our belts. Simultaneously, to take the systems, to simplify them in such a way like Barry did, allows you to see things more clearly as they're happening and then allows you to take them and move them wherever you want to. Music should be mobile. It should be that we can take one simple concept and then just zoop. We have to practice it a little bit, but you can just throw it in as you wish and see fit. It shouldn't be like, okay, now I gotta think all these numbers and all these different keys. It's like, no, it's just, it's the important arpeggio, but you're playing a four note chord. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> See how much support that is? All right, I hope that helps y'all. Please don't be afraid to um, like, comment, or reach out if you have questions or thoughts. Um, and of course, uh, subscribe. All right, I'll talk to y'all soon.